Today we will be talking about the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola. This will be the second edition of this series on the prison industrial complex and the history of the plantation prison system. Angola was named after the region in Africa where many slaves came from. Throughout its history, it would be labeled as the bloodiest prison in America and is still referred to as the Alcatraz of the South. In 1835, the first Louisiana State Penitentiary was constructed and became known as the Walls. This was a horrendous, rat-ridden jailhouse located in downtown Baton Rouge. At this time, inmates were leased to the private firm of McCadden, Pratt & Company. Most prisoners were forced to work in harsh conditions for numerous corporate and private businesses that paid for their labor. Everything from cutting sugarcane and coal mining to building railroads and plantation farming. These were the jobs convicts would be forced to work, and those who could not be leased out for whatever reason were put to work manufacturing clothing, farming, or maintaining the prison buildings. Following the American Civil War, Samuel Lawrence James made a deal with the state of Louisiana to clothe, feed, and shelter convicts in exchange for their labor. In 1880, Major James purchased an 8,000 acre plantation in West Feliciana Parish called Angola. He began keeping some inmates there at what used to be the old slave quarters, which later became Camp A. These prisoners, who were predominantly black, built levees, harvested sugar cane, picked cotton, planted crops, and maintained the prison buildings. As with Parchment Farm, the conditions within Angola were in many cases much worse than slavery. As James bluntly stated about convict laborers, when one dies, you get another. Convicts were cheap and easily replaced. They were worked to death and many li never lived out their sentences. On January 1, 1901, the state of Louisiana resumed control of all inmates after 55 years of the lease system. This came following a wave of public criticism and outrage directed at the appalling conditions uncovered in many prisons throughout the United States. The Board of Control purchased the 8,000 acres of land that Angola sits upon and immediately began to hire new security officers in an attempt to reduce the brutality within the prison. Staff were appointed by the governor and run by the state. Rates of brutality steadily decreased and until 1917, the prison seemed to be safer and conditions had improved. However, Angola suffered from crop failure due to floods in 1903 and in 1912, this happened again. All of this exasperated economic problems and led the state to abolish the Board of Control and turned control of the prison over to Henry L. Foucault, who immediately sought ways to reduce costs and increase economic production. Foucault fired most of the security officers and replaced them with inmate trustee guards. These were essentially armed convicts who would consistently brutalize and murder inmates. The trustee guard system lasted until 1972 and brutality rates steadily increased at this time to epic proportions. In 1952, a Minden, Louisiana judge by the name of Robert Kennan based his campaign for governor on the need to clean up Angola. This had been brought to light when 31 inmates cut their Achilles tendons in protest to the hard work and brutality they endured. After the election, Governor Kennan attempted to make good on his campaign promises and made some efforts to clean up the prison. By the 1970s, Elaine Hunt took over control and set about modernizing and reforming the prison farm to meet civilized standards. They expanded the prison and built four new camps. Medical and sanitation conditions were also improved. Burl Kane was the longest standing warden of Angola and he served for more than 20 years as director of the prison. He is responsible for the innovative job training programs and inmate trust programs that attempt to reduce the rate of recidivism which has declined in recent years. 
1973, the trustee system ended, but no new guards were hired, and only 300 prison guards were left to maintain the 4,000 prisoners that Angola housed at the time. Angola became the bloodiest prison in the U.S., maybe the world. Over 300 prisoners were stabbed, assaulted, and or murdered a year in the mid to late 1970s. By the 1990s, Angola was given the stamp of approval from the American Correctional Association and is supposedly meeting modern safety standards. Yet, it is still being condemned by civil rights organizations as unconstitutional. Today, Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the world, with over 6,000 inmates, over three quarters of which are serving life sentences. Much like Parchment Farm, Angola's front gate stands on its own as the inconspicuous barrier to an 18,000 acre prison plantation. Unlike Parchment Farm, Angola is not fully hidden away from public view. Although it is located in a very remote location, bordered on three sides by the Mississippi River and is miles away from most of the rest of society. Once a year, Angola opens its maximum security gates to the public to host the annual Angola Prison Rodeo. Inmates not only organize the rodeo, participate in it, and train all year for it, but prisoners are also allowed to sell their own manufactured goods known as hobbycraft. Angola is isolated from mainstream society, yet through the rodeo, KLSP, the prison radio, and a monthly magazine slash newspaper known as the Angolite, there is a continuous connection to the outside world. For most prisoners in Angola, this is the only access they will ever have to the outside world. The reality is that each year, more prisoners are buried in the prison cemetery than go out the front gate. There have been many books written by former prisoners about Angola. The most prominent are Solitary by Albert Woodfox and In the Place of Justice by Wilbert Rideau. Woodfox was a member of the Angola Three, a group of black power advocates who were arrested for robbery and later for killing a prison guard. They became infamous due to the fact that they were locked in solitary confinement for almost 30 years. Warden Burl Kane claimed that the black nationalist rhetoric and sentiment of the Angola Three posed a risk of spreading black power ideals. He claimed that black pantherism was inciting riots and revolutions throughout the jail. Kane forced these men to live for 30 years in solitary confinement in conditions that Amnesty International condemned as cruel and inhumane punishment that broke almost every basic human right. Finally, after decades of protest, appeals, and backlash from human rights groups, the Angola Three were released. Albert Woodfox writes about his experience at Angola in his book, Solitary, and it is an exceptional read detailing a life spent almost entirely alone. Wilbert Rideau was a black teen fed up with being underpaid and taken advantage of by his white employer. He decided to rob the bank next door and disappear. In the end, he shot and killed a white bank teller. This landed him a 25-year sentence at Angola. Rideau became embedded within the prison by finding a role for himself as the writer and publisher of the prison magazine, The Angolite. Rideau was given the ability to freely walk around the prison to interview staff, guards, and other prisoners. He was even granted leave from the prison in order to accept an award that he won for his writing at The Angolite. Rideau became involved within the politics and inner workings of the prison, almost acting as a moderator between various factions within the prison. He was respected and gained the trust of wardens, guards, staff, and prisoners alike, even to the point that high members of the prison would write recommendation letters for his release. Rideau's book, In the Place of Justice, tells this story through his own words and is an exceptional glimpse into life at Angola throughout the 20th century. Another book that I found interesting while doing research for this series was Showdown in Desire. 
This book follows the early attempt by Black Panther members to establish a chapter in Louisiana. They chose the Desire Housing Project as their headquarters and attempted to offer breakfast programs and social services for black youth. They came under direct fire from local police who brutalized Black Panther Party members and shot up their Desire Street headquarters while young children and teens were hanging out after school. This book gives a shocking view into police brutality and white resistance in response to the Black Power movement. This book also discusses the movement to free the Angola Three and explains how activists like Whoa. Mary Levine fought tirelessly for decades to get the Angola Three free. Uh...